parameterization, ground truthing, and benchmarking the importance of in situ data for global sustainability. Sure. So, the main point I want to make here is that we do live in a data rich world. We know that with the advent of satellite monitoring, we're in a much better position to monitor the world, global changes, and to look for the future. But I want to make the point that but data comes in all shapes and sizes. And what I'm particularly concerned about today is the data that is not remotely sensed, that is not global, but can be very useful. So the iconic picture of global change is the atmospheric measurements of CO2 and oxygen um, that have been taken since 1957. The point about this is it was originally envisaged as a work of one person, the network has been created. It's a quality controlled network because the flask measurements are passed around between laboratories. This tells us that CO2 has been increasing in the atmosphere and it tells us about the breathing of the planet. This kind of work has to be sustained in order to know what's going to happen in the future. These kinds of measurements have to be archived to keep that going. So when we're thinking about in situ measurements, in situ measurements have all sorts of purposes, and one of them is actually ground truthing the satellite data. That we have. Um, so I'm just giving you an example here. We now have satellite measurements of soil moisture, which is extremely important to know about both for vegetation modeling and for crops. Um, but it's important to be able to use in situ measurements. So this is a comparison one side of in-situ measurement and remote sensed um, soil moisture. We can also use these in-situ measurements for model validation. And here I'm showing two examples. This is the next generation of vegetation modeling that's being done here by my colleagues Colin Prentice and Wang Han. And what they've been able to use are literally thousands and thousands of individual measurements by people in the field, by plant physiologists, go out into the field and measure such things as the CI to CA ratio, mm -hmm. internal to external CO2 concentration, and the uh, Rubisco limited uh, photosynthesis rate. But they're able to build this model because, and validate this model, because people have been making in situ measurements for a long time. Many of these in situ measurements are not properly archived. You can also use it for model development. This is something that I've done. This is my fire model. When we started fire modeling, there was very little information we could get on lightning. Lightning is a key thing for ignitions in a fire. And so we just put in a number. So the straight lines across here are the numbers. But now, thanks to the wealth of information we have on precipitation and on lightning strikes, we're able to build models that have a more realistic patterning. And so I think our models are improving. But we, again, couldn't do this if we didn't have the data archived and we didn't have access to it. And 15 years ago, when we started building this model, we certainly did. Another way of doing this, and again, this comes back to individual measurements. One of the things in our fire model that's crucial is that trees burn. And what protects them from burning is the thickness of their bark, which can vary from very thin to extremely thick. Again, when we started building this model, we made guesses of the impact of bark thickness in protecting trees and put some numbers in. Now, thanks to the fact that many, many people around the world have been going out and measuring bark thickness with uh, tree height, we have again thousands and thousands of measurements that we are able to use to parameterize the model. And if you look at these, um, the values that we have in the lines here were the ones that I originally used in these models. And then the values, the dotted lines, so the reality, if you like, and the range that we should have in our models. What we were doing before was limited by the fact that we didn't have access to these kinds of data. I also want to make a plea here for thinking about long-term data, as in records of paleoclimate. And I think this is something that is extremely important and something that Madame La Ministre has touched on at the first day of this conference, we're building models to project what's going to happen in the future. We're building those models based on our modern understanding of the climate and tuned using modern observations of the climate. 
and then test it using modern observations. This is the modern climate that we're doing the tuning for. That's what's happened over, in fact, here about a thousand years. Very little. When we look at the projections, this is the 8.5 projection, I've cut it off because it goes higher than this. This is the 2.6 projection. What we're expecting over the 21st century is larger than anything we've ever seen. So this is like a filter model based on the modern, and I'm going to expect it to simulate climate changes well outside its range. The last time we saw changes of this order was at the last glacial maximum, so 21,000 years ago. This is the temperature change that's happened between 21,000 years ago and the present. So paleoclimate data is absolutely vital to test how well our models work. Um, and we actually have that data. So we have information on the ground from lake sediments and various other things around the world. And people, again, thousands of individual scientists have been collecting this data, putting this data somewhere, and making climate reconstruction. So these are climate reconstruction from 6,000 years ago, thanks to the work of a large number of people. And again, many of these data are archived. Some of them are not archived. We can use that kind of data to evaluate how well climate models work. Here I'm showing some features that are present in future climate simulations. So land ocean contrast is a feature that you see difference in temperature warming over land and over the ocean um, in the future climate simulations, that ratio turns out to be remarkably constant as you go through the future, through the historical period, and back into the last glacial maximum here. And the question is, is that ratio correct? Well, because we have data from the last glacial maximum, we're able to test this, and we can show that this feature of the future climate simulations is indeed a robust feature, as is the, the polar amplification. So increased warming in the Arctic. These are things you can believe in because they happened in the past and the data in the past show that it happened. But there are other things that I think we can't believe in in the future simulations, and here's one example of it. Um, so here's one example of it. If you look in the future simulations, we are predicting an increase in the monsoons everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. And people are starting to build models and, or management techniques to say we're going to have a nice increase in the monsoon. Okay, we had an increase in the monsoon 6,000 years ago. This shows a model simulation of that period. You can see this is at North Africa, a nice big monsoon. Here's the observations. The observations show that the whole of the Sahara was pretty much vegetated and lots of big lakes 6,000 years ago. So the reality is this is the data that we put together. This is what the models predict for 6,000 years ago. So if there's anybody in the room who's banking on a small increase in the monsoons, which would be very favourable in the future, you're underestimating it by about 50%. Go build some bigger dams, please. Okay? Again, um, again, just to show you in terms of we're spending a lot of money on building better, bigger and better models, the models we have now for using for projections in the future are, in fact, no different from the models we had <coughs> seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, this is a hotelling's test that just shows where those models disagree. In fact, um, there's no statistical difference between these sets of models. So are our models getting any better that we're using for predicting the future? No. So my point here is here are some examples of data that's collected by individuals. It's not remote sense, but which we absolutely need in order to be able to build better models, evaluate our models, and know whether we can have confidence in what's going to happen in the future. I wanted to finish with two key thoughts here. One of the things as a data user that drives me completely potty is when I see things like it. So here's a web page, I go to download my data, the data source has disappeared. Maybe it's somewhere else, but it's not where I thought it was. Here's another situation, a database I would love to use, and it wasn't updated after the year 2000. 15 years on, and all that data is no longer there. Here's a situation of a database that I do use, the TRI database, which has lots of biological data in, but half of the data is marked as not public. This is an issue we have to tackle. And as we go forward, I've been looking at databases that only look at one source of information. As we go forward, we're trying to find solutions for a sustainable planet in the face of climate change. We are going to have to pull data from many, many different sources. We're going to have to pull modeling data, 
we're going to have to pull agricultural information, we're going to have to pull information from economics, health, you name it. We need that information. Those data sources are very diverse, very different. We have not started to think, I think, about how we pull those data, how we have them in a common repository or distributed repository. The other thing I want to say, I don't know if you can see the numbers here, but this is a series of numbers from the um, simulations that ran up to IPCC, the amount of data that was stored. It started off in gigabytes, it's now in terabytes. Every time we do these, it goes up some more. So we have another problem here, which is the sheer volume of data that we need to be able to use. And this is for model outputs, you could say the same about all of the other sources. So this is very brief, but I have a few take home messages with my WDS hat on, World Data System hat on, about data. So we do live in a data rich world, but my experience is that data, access to data is often problematic. And therefore it's vital for Futura, the WDS, the CoData, the GEO, for everybody who's in the data provisioning business to foster open access and the recognition of the product worldwide. I believe that in situ data is vital and it's really important to maintain and expand those observational networks. This is important because as we get more and more satellite data, people start dropping out on the, on the in situ measurements and this is very cool. It requires coordination. Oops, go back. Um, I want to also make the point that the longer term historical and paleo records are vital, but very often ignored, and we need to think about those. I think there's a very important role here for trusted data repositories and services. We need those people to step up and actually archive and do things for us that they're not doing now. But in order to do that, they need support. Support from the community and financial. And then the final point is I believe that global sustainability requires combining data from many sources and we need to think of the optimal way of doing that. Thank you. Want to hit the roof lights? There's an excellent standing right and we do have time for one or two questions and comments. Yes, excellent talk, very enlightening. I'm just wondering on um, your uh, bullets there, your take home message, what are the proposed or possible potential sources for funding? What are the funding models for these trusted data resources? They're, they're not very good. I mean, basically, the trusted data repositories are nationally, often nationally run. Um, some countries have a long term funding scheme for them. Others, it's the whim of the government and they change all the time. And this is one of the things that WDS wishes to change. We wish to bring to the name, to the attention of our funding agencies that there has to be funding for individual scientists to put stuff into repositories, funding to support the repositories long term, and a plan so that if they no longer can support those repositories, there's a place to move things to. It's not in place at the moment, but it's something that we are trying to I hope everybody in the room is part of it. Sandy, these what you call in situ data, are they um, analog data or are they already digitized? Many of them are not digitized. Um, <coughs> you have a program for digitizing them? Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is really at the whim of individuals. And again, it's something that I think we need to take on board. Much of the paleo data that I work with all of the time is still sitting in people's drawers. <laughs> And as they retire, it gets thrown out. So I'm very concerned about rescuing data that we have. And again, there's no program for that at the moment, but it's something that we as a community need to think about. And so I think um, it's a question of getting the people who are, are interested in data and getting the groups that are working on preserving data to think <coughs> about that as an issue and find the funding for it. Because it does need somebody to actually sit there. It's a board of postdocs, please, to... Yeah. Thank you. Join the RDA data rescue group. Yes, dear. <laughs> I'm on board. No, I'm on board. No, thank you. I, I think these comments are very helpful in the sense that there's always been this issue of, of archiving and maintaining research data sets relative to what are more considered operational data sets. And I think in, in the sort of knowledge gathering 
getting the research data that you're talking about is really important. And then also looking at the accessibility of that from national or proprietary um, areas that's not, not yet public or not public accessible. Those issues are things that are constantly battling, um, but it's good to see it being specifically addressed so that we actually pay attention to that and actually try to make something happen. Um, so thank you.